Okay, so let's go on in our study of space curves. So what, what have we done in the first lecture? The definition, which is of course the first thing to do. Uh, examples, examples of normal curves and examples of some kind of pathologies that we have to be aware, cusps, nodes, you know. and then length, how to measure, how to define, how to measure, and how to compute the length of curves. Okay? And in the last part of the, la of the first lecture, we noticed that an important geometric property of the length, which has to be true of if the definition is well given, the fact that the length is independent of the reparameterization of the curve. Okay? So the length of a curve is, of course, something which depends just on the geometric trajectory and not on the way the point is moving on the trajectory. Okay? So this last, com this last uh, property induces us to ask a key question. Since for the same trajectory we can have infinitely many reparameterization, the natural question is, is there a, be a better one? Is there a best parameterization of a space curve? Okay? <laughs> so in order to answer this question, let's see. So we have a, a curve from some interval into three space. And we, f and we, we, we fix some fixed point in our, in our interval, okay? So really what we are doing is that we have our interval i, we fix some t naught here, and we have some curve, whoops, some curve alpha in space, okay? So this would be alpha of t naught, okay? To have, have just a little, uh, so once we fix this uh, base point t naught, we can define S as another fu as a function from I to R given in the following way. So it takes a parameter at time t and gives you the integral between t naught and t of it's better to change name inside the integral for the parameter. Okay. So this is nothing of nothing but the length. So you see. I've just written the formula for the length. The only thing to observe is that this is the length between alpha of t naught and alpha of t, okay, of this piece of curve. So in our previous notation, this is what it is, okay? <coughs> now, so what kind of function is this? Well, the function which takes a point in our interval to r. So the integrand of this function, which takes some u and gives you the length of the tangent vector at the point u. Okay. Well, this is just a continuous function. I don't give a name to this function. Okay. It's just the length of the tangent vector. Okay. Is in general, just continuous, okay? Do you agree? You see, it's the norm of a vector. So if you imagine how do you compute it, this is the square root of the sum of the squares of the components, okay? Now, since it's a square root of something, you have to be careful about the regularity. If the, if the thing inside the square root goes to zero, you lose the derivatives, okay? In general, you might lose the derivative, okay? So this is just a continuous function, okay, in general. And since this is the integral of this function, S is the integral of this function, and this is continuous, the best thing we can say is that S in general, is just C1, okay? So we gain one derivative, but not more than one by taking the integrals, okay? And of course, the first derivative 
S prime at, at t is just the integrand there evaluated at t. Okay? We cannot make the second derivative because in principle this could not exist, may not exist. Okay? So S in general, the point is that this function does not in general define a diffeomorphism. Okay? So S in particular S is not a diffeomorphism. Okay, because diffeomorphism means it's smooth with smooth inverse. So this is just C1. Okay. But I would like it to be a diffeomorphism. So what kind of condition should I add in order to be sure that S is in fact a diffeomorphism? Well, the point is exactly I have to avoid the fact that the, this, this vector becomes zero. Remember, so it's a square root of something. No? So the only way this is non-smooth is when this object becomes the zero vector. Okay? So if the norm, then we are okay then S is indeed a diffeomorphism. A diffeomorphism, and the only thing I have to be a bit careful is between which intervals, okay? Between I, which is the domain of the function S, and in general, I don't know the target, the, the image, so I just indicated like S of I, okay? In general, of course, there is no reason why S should be surjective on the whole real line, okay? Maybe you get only an interval of, uh, of values, okay? Okay, such curves. So this is a condition on curves that we are putting. So this condition here, such curves are called regular. We will comment a little bit later what it means, but I mean, the definition is just this, okay? But we will try to understand a bit better what, what are the implications of this. In any case, in this case, so this implies S is in fact smooth, is infinity, and let me call, call j this interval s of i, just to simplify a little bit the notations. But then, if it's a diffeomorphism, so we have that s, so between i and j, we have the diffeomorphism s. If it's a diffeomorphism, it has an inverse, okay? So I call phi, the inverse of S. Okay, so this goes from J to I. Okay. And then I can use phi to reparameterize my curve alpha. Okay. And define another curve, a new curve that I call beta beta of S now, which is by definition alpha composed phi. Okay? So where does this go? This goes from J to R3. Okay? So geometrically is the same curve as before, but the way we are parametrizing has changed. Okay, so before it was from I to R3, now it's from J to R3. And why this should be an improvement? After all, alpha was 
a nice curve right from the beginning. What is the special property of beta now parameterized in this way? Well, let's try to compute the velocity or the tangent vector to this, to this curve. So what is beta prime of s? Well, beta is alpha composed phi, so I can do it by chain rule. Okay? And what do I get? This is alpha prime evaluated, sorry, alpha prime evaluated at phi of s times phi prime of s. Okay? Not means that this is a number and this is a vector. Eh? So I write it in this in this way, but don't get confused. Okay? So this is a multiplication between a number and the vector. And how much is this? Well, what do I know? Phi is the inverse of s. So I know the derivative of phi, because I know the derivative of s. s prime is this. So phi prime is 1 over this. Okay, evaluated at the right point. So this is, this is what? This is alpha prime of phi of s at, at the point phi of s divided by the norm. Okay, again, if you want, it's chain rule, but now it's applied to the composition of s composed phi. s composed phi is by definition the identity. Okay, because one is the inverse of the other. So if I take the derivative, I get one, but if I use the chain rule, I get exactly this formula here. Okay? Well, this is nice. What is, what is, this, this, what is this saying? That the norm, so the, the norm of the velocity in this new parameterization is equal to one, you know, because I get the same thing for any s. So what is this parameter achieving? This parameter is achieving uniform motion on our trajectory. So parameterized in this way, a regular curve is parameterized in a way that the velocity is constantly equal to 1. Okay? Of course, as a vector, it will change. But the norm is constant. Okay? We are not saying that the vector beta is constant. Just its norm, it's constant. Okay. Now this, this is a very important class of parameterization. So we, we should give them a name. So definition. Alpha, a curve in R3. Of course, I always assume it's a, it's a infinity curve. Eh? Otherwise, I mean, all our theory. So this is, is set. It's uh, is parameterized with arc length. And we will not write it again. We will always write P A L. Okay, for short, for short, if it has exactly this property, if the norm is equal to 1 for any t. Okay? And then what we have just proved essentially in this simple argument is this theorem. Every regular curve can be parameterized with arc length. Okay? This is just what we what we argued, what we proved here. Notes, comments.
this parameter is not uniquely defined. Okay. Arc length, or S, let me just indicate it the symbol for short, S is not unique. Oh, what does it depend on? You see, to define S, I had to use a fixed point, a base point on my curve. So depends, it depends on T naught, okay, on this base point that I've chosen right of the, from the beginning. <coughs> and on a constant of integration. doesn't matter. In any case, the way two different arc lengths are related is very easy. Okay? So we will see it. So examples. One. So for example, lines. If you take a straight line, is it? So what the way we define the line was as a parameterized in the parameterized form yesterday, alpha of t, t v plus v naught for some fixed vectors v naught and v, okay? Here the parameter was free to move, so our interval i was the whole real line. So to, the, to, co to compute the arc length, we need to fix t naught, doesn't matter, for example, T naught equal to zero, just for example. Okay. Question: Is a line a regular curve? Well, what is alpha prime? The, the question is: Does its velocity vector vanishes some anywhere? Well, alpha prime is exactly the vector v. So unless we are in the completely stupid and pathological case, okay. If alpha prime, alpha prime of t is equal to v, to the vector v. So of course, when we write a line in this form, we implicitly assume that v has to be a non-zero vector. Otherwise, this straight line is actually the point. Okay? So as soon as it's really something geometrically meaningful, it's regular. Okay? So we can play the game. And what does the game give us? Well, s of t by definition, would be the integral. I've chosen t naught to be equal to 0, so between 0 and t, of, alpha, of the norm of alpha prime. Well, the norm of alpha prime is nothing but the norm of v in du, okay, in our notations. Okay? <coughs> but this is nothing but t norm of v. Okay? Now, what is this asking me? If I want to, re to, to write the curve beta, I need to compute phi, the inverse of s. Of course, in this example, everything is, is simple. That's why we are doing it. So what is the inverse of, well, let me erase everything. So what is phi? Phi will take s. So in fact, s was taking t to s by definition. So phi is taking s to t. Okay. Now, if this is s of t, what is t of s? Okay. So phi of s is equal to s. So this is s. What is t is s divided by the norm of v. OK? So now we are done. In a sense, we can write immediately beta of s. 
beta was what? Was alpha composed phi. OK? Well, but this is alpha. So instead of t, I need to put phi. OK? So beta of s will be s over norm of v times v plus v naught. OK? Yeah, so sometimes I forget then as a notation this is a vector eh? plus v naught. OK? And now, of course, you see that we have achieved uniform motion. I mean, in some sense, it was uniform right from the beginning because if you parameterize something in this form, the velocity, so the velocity is constant. So in this uh, simple example, the only thing we have achieved is really to make this constant equal to 1. Because now if I compute beta prime, of course, I get v over norm of v, whose norm is 1. Okay. OK, this is clearly the simplest. Uh, now let me give you a, a slightly less trivial example. Let's take this. It's, uh, these are all excuses also to introduce examples to which are useful for later on computations. OK, so let me take from R a planar curve, R2, another famous planar curve, which is called lo uh, logarithmic. Spiral. Okay. And this is the curve parameterized in the following way. You take t and you associate it a e to the bt cos t, a e to the bt sine t, where a is a positive number and b is a negative number. This is just, again, a convention. Well, the name itself tells you everything, but you can check that the name is not given by a crazy reason. So why this is called the logarithmic spiral? You see, if there wasn't this e to the bt term, no? if in these components you, you, rem you think this disappear, of course, what is a cos t a sin t? It's a circle with center the origin of radius a, OK? Well, and what is the effect of putting? In fact, there is in both core components, there is this. So you can think of this e to the bt to be in front of everything, no? So what is the effect of this e to the bt? That somehow this is changing. As t moves, it's changing the radius. So this, this particle would like to stay on a circle, but this factor here is, cha is continuously changing the radius of the circle that, that the particle would like to lie on, OK? And how is it changing? Since b is negative, as t in increases, this radius is going to 0, OK? So then, forever. Okay, you never reach the origin, of course, but you keep on whirling around. Okay, so this is, well, of course, it's a terrible picture, but it gives you the idea, okay? Well, let's play our game for this example. What is S of t? Well, in, in actually computing F of, S of t, we will understand also if it's a regular curve or not. So S of t, again, we have to fix a base point. The interval is the whole real line. Why not taking t naught equal to 0? Why not? It's just any point on the, on the, on the domain. Okay? Now, s of t would be, by definition, the integral between 0, which is t naught, and t of the norm of the tangent vector. Okay? <laughs> well, let me erase this beautiful picture, because I need space. So what is the, let me indicate first, I leave it as the norm of what, of which vector? I need to take the derivative of this. So it's a, uh, uh, of course, there is always 
well, doesn't matter, A. So the, the derivative of the first component, it's B, E to the B T cos T minus, no, so this is the derivative of this, minus E to the B T sine T. And this is the derivative of the first component, okay? Derivative of the second, there is always A, and then B E to the B T sine T, and now plus e to the bt cos t. And of course, I'm using not the best notation because now I'm integrating with respect to t. I, I, left, the name, I left the name t for the, instead of u. OK? You are grown up now. You, you won't be mistaken by this. OK, so this t and this t don't confuse you, OK? So what is the norm of this vector? The norm of this vector is the square root of this squared plus this squared. You see immediately that here I can take out a e to the bt is everywhere. OK? And a is supposed to be positive, And of course, e to bt is positive. So if I take it square and the square root, it remains the same. So this becomes what? The integral uh, between 0 and t of a e to the bt times what? I should take what is left. So now so we, have removed, we have taken out e to the bt. So we have this one squared, which is what? b squared cos squared t plus sine t squared, psi squared t. Then that would be minus 2 b cos t sin t. I don't even write it down because on the other part, I, will, I see immediately that I have plus 2, the same thing. Okay? So the double product will, will erase. So now here, what do I get? I get plus b squared sine squared t plus cos squared t. Everything to the power 1 half okay? because this was the norm in dt. So how much is this? Well, you see, little miracle, 0t, a, e to the bt, what's left inside this, uh, this square, this parenthesis? So this is b squared cos squared plus, so this is b squared, and this is 1, okay? So times b squared plus 1 to the power 1 half in dt. Oh, you can see this is not, uh, this is a number. And so this is the final result is just uh, e to the bt minus 1 over b times a b squared plus 1 to the power 1 half. Okay. So this is the arc length. Well, actually, we should have commented. Is this a regular curve? You see, the norm of the tangent vector is, is this one. We have computed inside the integral, no? Can this be 0? Is there any value of t for which this is 0? Uh, this is a positive number. This is a positive number, and this is a positive number for any t. Okay. So this is a regular curve. So our theory applies to it. This is the, the arc length. So in principle, we could reparameterize our curve, alpha, and construct beta. I'm not going to do it because now there is nothing to learn. What, the only thing missing is what? Is writing down the inverse of this function. So this is s of t. I need to write down t of s, Okay, which is easy. It's not Okay. Of course, it will be a logarithmic. S of t is an exponential. T of s will be a logarithm. Okay. And then I just compose it, and, then, and that's it. Now, OK, but this is just to, I mean, just to make a non-trivial example of the computations. <coughs> now, now, what I'm going to say now, I, I know it's going to sound very mysterious to you. But I would like you to spend a few minutes thinking about this. 
you, you, you should practice a little intellectual game. And in this case, it will be kind of strange. But you will see in going higher dimensions, it will become more and more delicate. In the sense that the existence of arc length has an important philosophical implication. Now, suppose that you are a zero-dimensional object. I, I mean, that we are. I'm, I'm not trying to offend you, OK? <laughs> Any of us is a zero-dimensional object. And suppose that our universe is one-dimensional. It's actually, it's a curve. So we are particles moving, living all our life on a curve. Okay. Suppose two of us try to communicate, living on two different universes. So what kind of properties you can communicate about your And one, of course, is asking the other, how does your universe look like? Well, the only thing you can really communicate is metric properties of your universe. I mean, my universe is made in a way that if I move a distance one, something happens. Okay. Now, arc length means that two zero-dimensional beings see the same thing. I would like you to think a bit. It's, it's difficult to, but I mean, since on every universe there is arc length, as long as it's a regular curve. So the only thing that they could discover is that the one lives in a regular world and the other lives in an in a irregular world. Okay? That's the only thing. As soon as they are both regular curves, they would see the same universe. Okay? What it means, there is no one-dimensional intrinsic geometry. Okay? Now, this is the first appearance. I, I propose you this intellectual game to you, because when, when we will go to surfaces and hopefully to higher dimensional objects a little bit, uh, this will become more and more interesting. Okay? But there is no really geometry, intrinsic geometry of one-dimensional objects, okay? because of this uh, simple theorem that we just proved. Okay? On the other hand, looking from outside, so this happens because you are, the, your intellectual game has to be imagined to be on a curve, and the only thing that you can see is the curve itself. You don't see the world outside, by definition, because otherwise that, that would not be your universe. I mean, the universe is by definition the, the thing you see. Okay? So the fact that this curve lives in R3, so there is a huge space around, you don't know. Okay? That's something you don't know. The only thing you see is, is your, your little one-dimensional universe. Okay? On the other hand, we are doing geometry, three-dimensional geometry, so we can look from outside. And of course, we think of two curves. I mean, they can be very different. So this depends not on the intrinsic geometry, but on the way the curve is put in the big space. Okay? And that's why we go on. Otherwise, everything, otherwise it would be game over. Okay? So OK, there is no intrinsic geometry, and that's it. Well, there is extrinsic geometry. So the way a curve is put in R3, give some geometry to the curve. After all, a straight, I mean, if, if you are a zero-dimensional object living on a straight line, and you are a zero-dimensional object living on a circle, and you tell me, well, you know, these things are the same thing intrinsically, OK? But on the other hand, looking from outside, I want to detect the difference. So extrinsic geometry must detect the difference between these two things, OK? How do we do it? Well, we associate at every point to a space curve a special reference. So suppose this is our curve in R3. So this is alpha of i. Okay. Now. And here we have our point alpha of t. Mm -hmm. 
Suppose this is parameterized with arc length. So from now on, unless alpha is parameterized with arc length. Okay. <coughs> well, we certainly have one natural vector of R3 associated to a curve. It's tangent vector okay, at this point. So here we have alpha prime. Well, in fact, it would have been better to call it S. Since it's parameterized with arc length, let me call it directly S. Okay? It's this special parameter that we have just defined. Okay, so at that point, we, we know one special vector. It's tangent vector. So let's call it, let's call it T. So this is, by definition, alpha prime of S. And now... Now, t is automatically of norm 1, okay, because of arc length. Okay, this is the key property of arc length. Okay. So, in particular, of course, the norm is equal to the norm squared if it's equal to 1. So, T of S, the scalar product, so this is just to introduce the symbol scalar product, okay, in my notation, T of S, T of S is equal to 1. Now, I take the derivative of this. This is an equation which holds for any S. So, if I take derivative, what? How do, you take the uh, how do you make derivative of a scalar product as the standard product? So derivative of the first times the second plus the first times derivative of the second. Okay? So this becomes t prime of s t of s plus t of s t prime of s. So this is from the formula. Equal to what? Well, equal to zero. Okay? And then, of course, I observe the scalar product is symmetric. So this is, a, this is exactly like T prime T of S is equal to 0. Okay? I already canceled the 2 because it's equal to 0, so it doesn't matter. Okay? So this means what? This means that the derivative of the tangent vector, so T prime, is always... orthogonal to t. At every point, the derivative of the tangent vector is orthogonal to the tangent vector itself. OK? This induces a natural definition, as usual. So let me define the function k of s to be the norm of t prime of s. Okay. So this function, which takes the norm of this vector, is called the curvature of alpha at s. Okay. Again, how regular this function is? Well, this function is the norm of a vector. So it would be smooth. It would be a beautiful, smooth function as long as the thing inside the norm stays away from 0. So in general, it's only continuous. So this is only continuous in general. It is smooth if this vector is different from 0 for any s. Okay? So regularity drops if this vector vanishes. Okay? Well, of course, another immediate property of this function is that this function is non-negative because it's the norm of a vector. Okay? Now, From now on, 
So in all the computations we are going to do today, from now on, we assume k is positive. Okay, so this vector does not vanish anywhere. <coughs> okay. If this is the case, the point is that I can divide by k. That's what I gain from this. So if this is the case, I call this definition 1. And then in definition 2, I can define a new vector, a second vector naturally assigned to the curve alpha, which I call n, which will be just t prime of s divided by its norm. That's why I need to make this assumption, OK? Because otherwise, I'm dividing by 0. Of course, I can write it in this by, by obvious. Okay? And this is called the normal vector. Okay. So you see, in our, in our picture, well, in, in my picture, if s is uh, moving in this, if alpha is moving in this way as s is increasing, well, I can imagine that alpha is change, alpha prime is changing in this way, no? So more or less, if I want to draw some reasonable picture, my n will be more or less here. Okay. And this is the normal vector. But now I am in R3. And I have already two unit vectors. Of course, n as norm 1, no? because it's a vector divided by its norm. So I have two orthogonal vectors of norm 1. So there is only one way up to psi to complete it to an orient to a basis of R3, to an orthonormal basis of R3. Okay. I, I miss only one direction. So as a convention, so I, my only doubt would be, should I take plus, plus or minus the missing direction? So we fix it by, by this uh, definition here. OK? Where this symbol for me stands for the vector product, OK? I prefer to call it wedge instead of cross, because it introduces only confusion. Okay. So first times the second gives me b. And this is called the b normal. Vector to alpha at s. Okay. So in my picture, this would become a bit complicated now to, to draw it properly. But you see, now if this is T, N, B would be coming out of the, so B of S. Okay. Now, so if you want. We can put everything together in the last piece of the definition. So we have a, a, a reference, an orthonormal basis. At every point of our curve, we have constructed an orthonormal basis of R3, which is somehow geometrically remembering how the, 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 the curve looks like. Okay? And this is called. Frenet three or reference or basis or whatever you want. Okay, the only important word there is frenet. Okay, three vectors. Okay. okay. 
Is it clear how these three vectors are constructed? It's quite by taking essentially derivatives of alpha and vector products. Well, now, so how the local geometry of our curve should be equivalent to the way this three moves around. So you see, you should imagine at every point, for any S, you have, so you, you should imagine these three vectors moving no? in, uh, in time, okay? And the way they move is adapted to the curve. So knowing how they move should be the same thing as knowing the curve. That's now the game we want to play, okay? So what are the relationship between the derivatives of these vectors and geometric properties of these vectors? So we know something by definition. So T prime of S is by definition K times N. This is the definition of K up to now. This is a, a tautology given the definition. And then we know what? Another, the other key relationship is B is equal to T wedge n. Okay. So let's take derivative of this one and let's see what it happens. So what is b prime? I drop uh, of s of s of s of s. Okay. So b prime is what? Well, how do you take derivatives of a vector product? Have you ever done this exercise? Well, this is the moment to do it. Okay. Well, it's the usual, it's the usual rule, okay? You differentiate the vector products as the standard product. So derivative of the first times the second plus first times the derivative of the second. Well, why is that? Exactly. Basically, write down, if you want, uh, explicitly how it is. And you can see it's, it is really a product of the components of the vectors. Okay. So if you write it down in two lines, you have a, you have a proof. Okay. So this is t prime wedge n plus t wedge n prime. Okay. <coughs> but t prime... But t prime and n are proportional. n is, by definition, the rescaling of norm 1 of t prime. So what does it happen to a vector product if you take the vector product to proportional vectors? It becomes 0. Okay? So this disappears, and we are left with t wedge n prime. Okay? So what do we learn out of this? Well, we learn that B prime, so B prime is orthogonal to T because, of course, out of this, for example, I extract the information that B prime is orthogonal to T because it's T wedge something, okay? First bit of information. But then, what else I know? Well, B prime has to be also orthogonal to what? To B. Why is that? You see, B is a vector, is a family of vectors of constant norm. You see, T as norm 1 for any S. N as norm 1 for any S. So the vector product, these are orthogonal, the vector product as norm 1 for any S. The norm of B is constantly equal to 1, okay? But then there's, there's always the same argument. If you take the derivative, so if B scalar B is equal to 1, huh, I take the derivative and I get B prime scalar B equal to 0, exactly as we did for T at the beginning of our story. Huh? Now we do it for B. So B prime 
is orthogonal to B automatically because of this property. And it's also orthogonal to T. But T, N, and B are a basis of R3. So this vector B prime has to be what? It has to be proportional to N. There is nothing left. Okay? So B prime must be B prime of S. So all this together implies what? That B prime of S has to be something that I call tau, tau of S, some function, because of course for every time there will be a proportional factor, N. Okay, so this is a function, okay? Now, this function here, tau of s, is called the torsion of alpha at s. Okay? Now, again, since I, I usually make a comment on the regularity of this object, remember k was only continuous in general, but we are under the assumption it's positive, so we are in the, re in the situation where k is actually a smooth function. How regular is tau? Well, tau is automatically smooth. Because one way to write down tau being n of norm 1, n is of norm 1. So one way to write down tau is to say that tau is equal to the projection of b prime in the direction of n. These are smooth vectors. So the scalar product is a smooth function. So here you don't have problems of maybe tau equal to 0, non 0, because you don't care. Okay? It's the projection of a family of smooth vectors on a family of smooth vectors. That's OK. So tau is always smooth. Okay. So we see what? The derivative of the vector t has induced us, so just to, in order also to remember what we are doing, it's useful to know. So we have the vector t, and looking at the derivative, we constructed k. We have the vector b, and looking at the derivative, we have just constructed tau. So what is left? We have the vector n. So what is n prime giving us? Is it giving us another function or not? Let's go and check. So what do we know about n prime? Again, n is a vector of norm 1. So n prime is certainly orthogonal to n by the usual argument. OK, so let's see. What else do we know? Of course, we know that n t is equal to 0. And we know that n b is equal to 0. I mean, if I want to know information about n prime, I take these equations and take the derivative. Okay? And what do I get? Uh, well, take the derivative of the first. This implies n prime t plus n t prime is equal to 0. The derivative of the second gives me n prime b plus n b prime is equal to 0. OK. Very good. Is there anything here I know already? Yes. n prime t is what I'm looking for. No? But here, it's n t prime. What is n t prime? It's here. Huh? It's k. Okay. So the first equation becomes n prime t plus k of s is equal to 0. And the second tells me n prime b plus n b prime 
Well, nb prime is, is exactly this one. OK, so plus tau is equal to 0. OK? <coughs> OK, so we can make the final summary. This is a theorem which are usually, is usually referred to Frenet formula because it's just a list of. Uh, but remember, which are the assumptions? Everything we did all for a curve in R3, parameterized with arc length, and don't forget k positive. Okay. Otherwise, you have to stop much earlier. And then the theorem tells you just t prime is equal kn. The last one, b prime is equal tau n. And in between, you put what we just discovered. n prime is what? Well, the component along t is minus k. And the component along B is minus tau. OK? It's an orthonormal frame. So if I want to, I mean, this is exactly tell me exactly the components. Do you agree? So this is the proof. I mean, there is nothing to prove now. This is done. And actually, in some sense, two of these are essentially definitions, because this one is the definition of k. This one is the definition of tau. So really, the, o the only theorem is here. OK? Very good. Well, OK, so we have associated to any regular curve with k positive, if you want. I mean, two functions, curvature and torsion. And we have this nice picture of how these vectors move around okay, in space as the curve goes into space. Okay. So now the, ob now the obvious question is, what are they measuring? I mean, what is the geometric meaning? What are the geometric meanings of the functions k and tau? Well, the first thing to do is to compute some examples and to start some, having some feeling. Okay. And then you can start guessing what are the, the real meaning. Any list of examples should start from the straight lines. Remember, we want the curve to be parameterized by arc length. So when I say line is something like this, now to be parameterized by arc length, it means that v is automatically a vector of norm 1. OK? So what is the tangent vector? What is t? Well, t of, doesn't matter. I'm, I'm, doing, I'm confusing your mind a little bit on purpose. So the parameter, I'm calling it t, and it's arc length. OK, don't be confused, whatever the name is. Arc length is that parameter, or one of those parameters, for which the tangent vector is norm 1. OK, if it's not called s, it doesn't matter. OK, so what is t? <coughs> well, t is uh, the tangent vector, so this is t of t. Is, all, is, equal, is constantly v, OK? So that's good. But then what should I do to compute everything else? Well, I should take the derivative of this, compute its norm, and this will give me k and n, OK? But that's the problem. t prime is 0, constantly equal to 0. So 
Straight lines don't follow in this category. I have to stop there. Okay. Meaning, of course, I can define k of t. k of t is well defined. The point is that it's just constantly equal to 0. Okay. What it would be completely wrong is to tell what is n and what is b. I don't know. And you can also think that it's, it's rightly so. Okay. Because in a straight, if, you, if you think of a straight line, there is, of course, a well-defined tangent vector. But there is no well-defined, I mean, there is not a better normal vector. There is certainly a, a well-defined normal plane. But why should I pick one normal, why, why, why there should be one better vector in this plane? They are all the same. So it should be, it, it would be wrong. You see, if this theory would be identifying one special vector, that would be something strange. Okay? So fortunately, it doesn't. Okay? Normal vectors to a straight line are all the same. And, and you stop there. Okay? Very good. Circles. Well, circles, we decided that alpha of t, uh, one parameterization, one nice parameterization of, cir of, uh, of circles was uh, r cos t over r, sine t over r. And I don't want to, I mean, it's a planar curve, but now in some sense I want to remember that they lie in some plane, okay? For example, in the one z equal to zero. So I add the, the third coordinate plus some the center vector c, which is constant, OK? Well, what is alpha prime? Well, alpha prime, what, or, or let's first compute alpha prime, because we don't even know if this is regular, what is arc length. We have never done this exercise. So what is alpha prime of t? Well, alpha prime of t is, well, of course, the derivative of c disappears. It's a constant vector. So what is left here? Well, this is r. Times what? Minus, well, 1 over r sine t over r. OK? 1 over r cos t over r, and then 0. OK? And now you see why yesterday I played this game. OK? And this is the moment that you understand I was not completely crazy. OK? Because r, r, R. OK? So what is the advantage now? Because really, it, it's true, t over r is just any number. So it's not better than t over 2r or t over r squared. Or, OK? So, but this is the key cancellation. OK, so this is equal to minus sine t over r cos t over r, 0 which has the nice property of being a vector of norm 1, OK? For any t, this is the, the nice thing, the useful, simple thing. And, for, and what I learned, what do I learn from this? Well, I learned that this is a regular curve. And so I can go on. And that t, this, exactly this t is arc length. So I can do exactly the computation in the way I did in the, in the general theory. OK? So this implies, oh, sorry. This implies that t is arc length. Let me write it down. OK? And t. So t is equal to alpha prime. Now the question is, well, how, what is t prime? Well, t prime, I just go on taking derivatives. So this is the vector minus 1 over r cos. Minus 1 over r sine t over r, 0. Okay. What is the curvature? Well, the curvature. 
is the norm of this vector. Okay? So k of t. How much is the, no the norm of this? It's 1 over r. So it's constant and is non-zero. Okay? So I put in brackets, I mean, non-zero, it's important to check because I want to go on with my theory. Okay? So I can, I can decide what is n, okay? because n would be exactly the unit vector in this direction, which is obvious what it is. Just remove the 1 over r. Okay? So it's minus cos t over r minus sine t over r. And what is b? Well, b by definition is t wedge n, OK? <coughs> I don't know which is the, the, your favorite way to compute cross products. Mine is to put them as lines of a matrix and compute the minus, OK? In any case, check it quickly. Do it in the way you want. And you have to find this, OK? Out of which I find out what? This implies that in particular, so b is a constant vector. And this implies that b prime is equal to 0. But b prime equal to 0 means tau is equal to 0. So it's the, con is the, is the 0 function. OK? And that's it. I mean, there's nothing else you can, you can say now. OK? So circles have constant curvature equal 1 over the radius and 0 torsion. OK? Now, I leave you as an exercise the example 3. OK? If you take helices in the way I wrote them yesterday, you will find out that, again, I was not cheating you. Again, the parameter was written in a funny form. And it sorry, the third component of which vector? Oh, sorry, yes, of course. So for helices, the way I wrote them yesterday, you will find out, again, that the way I wrote them was a bit strange, but it was exactly to achieve the same thing. So the parameter I gave you was exactly arc length. And then you can play the same game, OK? And you will, you will find that the curvature is exactly a over a squared plus b squared. And tau, tau is now non-zero, and it's actually minus b over a squared plus b squared. Okay. OK, so we can move on to some, at least some simple geometric interpretations of these functions. Can I erase this? So to end this lecture, we can give at least. So you see, we have introduced these functions. It's natural to say, well, suppose that these functions are constant. I mean, what, what is this saying to, about the curve? Okay. And in fact, among constants, if they are actually 0, So remember, you, you have to put yourself in the situation where you can actually use the theory. So 
parameterized with arc length and positive curvature. And then, for example, you can see that alpha is planar if and only if tau is equal to zero. We have, we have computed the, the torsion of the circle, and we found zero. So now you see that this is, was not an accident. Okay. So the torsion measures exactly how much you have to stretch it. I mean, so if a curve would like to lie on a plane, and instead you are pushing it in R3, in the three space, I mean, there is some kind of effort you have to do. And this effort is measured exactly by the function tau. Okay. So it's a very neat interpretation. Proof. First, suppose, let's first suppose tau is constantly equal to zero. Why should it be planar? <coughs> well, what is tau? Tau, remember, is uh, the norm of B prime. So tau equal to zero means that B is constant, yeah, because B prime is zero. Okay, tau equal to zero means B prime is zero, so B of S is equal to V, a constant vector. Okay. Of course, this is not particularly important, but it, it's always a vector of norm one because it's B. It's constructed as a, a unit vector. But then, if I take the scalar product of alpha of S with this vector V, okay, and I take the derivative, okay, I'm taking the function alpha of s, scalar product, this vector v. And I take its derivative. How much do I get? Well, this is a constant, so it doesn't matter. The derivative is, it doesn't go here. So the only thing I get is t, so alpha prime, which is equal to t, t, scalar product, v. Okay. But V was B. So T and V must be orthogonal. Okay. So this is zero. Okay. But then th this means that this function is a constant function. It's a function whose derivative is zero at every point. Okay. So this implies that the function alpha of S scalar V is equal to some number A. No? But what, what, have I, what have we written here? This means exactly that alpha lies. So this is, a, this is the equation of a plane in R3. Do you agree? Maybe not passing through the origin, OK? We never said a is equal to 0. OK, okay which is? which is the equation of a plane in R3. OK, so this closes this way of the theorem. The other way, well, now you can reverse everything. If it's planar, It means that there exists a number and a vector for which alpha satisfies this equation. And then you go upstairs instead of downstairs. If this is true, t, so the tangent vector, satisfies this equation. Okay. And then b has to be this vector here. And that's it. Because if b has to be this vector, in particular, b is constant. And so b prime is 0. And so tau is 0. 
So exactly the same stairway of, of, uh, of things, but read in the opposite direction gives you, so the converse is exactly the same thing in the opposite direction, okay? Okay, last thing. So this, this gives a nice first interpretation of the torsion. What can we say about the curvature? Well, so suppose we have a curve parameterized with arc length such that its curvature is constantly equal to zero. In fact, k is the zero function. I would like to state a theorem like this, but I, if and only if, one vote for the straight line. Somebody else votes for something else. I mean, we, winning, winning a poll with one vote is, uh, OK. It's, it, is, it is OK. I mean, this is a, it's a, it, if alpha is a piece of line, OK? Proof. Well, we have computed the curvature of a, of a line, and we have checked. So in this way, already done, OK? So the only thing is, why, why should this be true? Well. What well, does it mean that k is equal to 0, more or less in the similar spirit? So k equal to 0 implies what? Implies that the tangent vector is constant. Because k is the norm of t prime. So that means that t prime is 0. So t is equal to a constant vector. But t is alpha prime. Okay. And then I integrate. So if I know alpha prime, what is alpha? Well, alpha is, of course, the integral of alpha prime, plus a constant of integration, if you want. But alpha is equal to tv plus v0. Okay, and that's it. Well, okay, probably we, this is enough to stop. So next time, what are we going to do next time? You see, what we did today was to identify geometric objects naturally associated to a curve. The three vectors, if it's possible, T and B, and these two functions, k and tau. Okay. Now, as geometers, we ask, is this all? And actually, understanding what, what does it mean, it's interesting. I mean, what does it mean, is it all? Is it all means, for example, if you give me two functions, and you would like them to be the curvature and the torsion of something, is it possible? Well, there are some obvious constraints because the function that you want to be the curvature has to be positive, especially if there is also a torsion. No? Otherwise, uh, you cannot speak about torsion when, tau is, uh, when k is 0. So one function certainly has to be positive. But is, the, is that the only constraint? And suppose you can do it. In how, ma how many curves can have the same curvature and torsion? 
And actually, what does it mean, how many? Because, of course, the space of curves is an infinite dimensional what object, whatever. Okay? So the, the solution will be exactly, yes, give me any two functions, provided they satisfy uh, nothing. The only constraint is what we said. And there will be a unique curve but unique up to something. And we have to decide everything in mathematics is unique up to something. No? When you classify groups, it's unique up to isomorphism. No? When you classify vector spaces, it's unique up to linear isomorphism. When you classify topological spaces, it's unique up to homeomorphism. Now we are doing another type of geometry. So our, our meaning of unique will be unique up to rigid motions. This is the group that it's moving everything around. Rigid motions of R3. Two curves which are obtained one from the other via a rigid motion of R3 are totally indistinguishable from our geometric point of view. They are the same curve. They might actually look quite different, but they are the same curve. We, we are, okay. So the be and still, there are infinitely many curves obtained in this way. So it's unique only up to, okay? So this is the best theorem you can hope, and this is the best, in fact, it, what it holds, okay? And we will prove it next time.